Welcome everyone to this webinar and panel on overcoming roadblocks to the implementation of psychedelic assisted therapies. I'm grateful to have some awesome panelists here today that Zach will shortly introduce. Amy, Chris, Tadeus, and Graham, that were Zach then moderating. Just to quickly introduce Zach, Zach is an excellent writer covering the psychedelics industry for the last few years. If you don't know him yet from the trip report you should, check it out online and subscribe. He has recently partnered together with Beckley Waves to further improve the coverage of the psychedelics field. And he's of course also now expanding into moderating, which I'll be sure he will do a great job at. But before we'll dive in, there are three things you should know about RCPR, which is together with Blossom co-organizing this webinar. First, we're organizing a full day about implementing psychedelics therapies on the 21st of September, where we'll have seven more hours on how to actually do this and look at this from different angles. You can get tickets for that day or the rest of ICPR, which will focus more on the science of psychedelics with a 30% discount with the code ZOOM30 for next 48 hours. But are you more comfortable behind the screen? or can't you travel to ICPR, then join the live stream. Today is the last day to get it at 99 euros. So I think that's a great moment to do that. You can ask questions via the Q&A. My fellow host Bradley from ICPR and I will help select and organize the questions and Zach will get them to the panelists in about 40 to 45 minutes. Zach, the floor is all yours. Great. Thank you, Flora. Welcome, everybody. Thanks to ICPR for, for hosting the event, and thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Obviously, we only have about 45 minutes to an hour, and this is perhaps the largest topic in the quote-unquote psychedelic space that we could possibly try to wrap our heads around. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panelists, and we'll get right into it. First, we have Amy Emerson. Amy is the CEO of MAPS Public Benefit Corp., the wholly owned subsidiary of MAPS, the Association for Psychedelic Studies, a nonprofit. As CEO, Amy has led the growth and development of this new subsidiary. She is responsible for the overall global regulatory strategy and implementation of research programs with a focus on the MDMA assisted psychotherapy program within MAPS PBC. Tadeus Horat is joining us from Perea. Tadeus has spent 15 years working in the EU environment, leading the policy and advocacy work of several civil society organizations in the field of brain health. He was instrumental in setting up the new advocacy alliances as the National Brain Council's Portuguese Societal Impact of Pain Platform and the Global Partnership on One Neurology. He is cooperating with the World Health Organization and other global health advocates, and he is the founder of the Psychedelic Access and Research European Alliance. Graham Pachenik is a registered patent attorney and founder of Calix Law. He is working with the businesses in the cannabis and psychedelic spaces to design and implement their patent strategy and generate value and growth through intellectual property. And finally, we have Chris Cotterman. Chris is the co-founder and chair of the board of the International Therapeutic Psilocybin Rescheduling Initiative, a global coalition launched to pursue and secure a rescheduling of psilocybin under the 1971 Convention on Psychotropic Substances. And so without further ado, I want to jump into our discussion today and give each of these experts in their field the chance to speak to their specific areas. But one thing I wanted to point out, I, I looked up the definition of roadblock, and I thought this was interesting to note, and I'll read it. A barrier or barricade on a road, especially one set up by the authorities to stop and examine traffic. That struck me as very apropos, you might say. And so to begin, we'll just set the stage here. Those authorities and those roadblocks come from a variety of different organizations, or I should say authorities and institutions. And first up, I'll let Amy discuss probably the most salient for the moment is that of the FDA and the drug approval and regulatory process. And particularly with a look at the next, let's say 16 to 18, 24 months. And I'll let Amy speak to sort of the developments that we can look to from MAPS and what the next major milestones are on their drug development program. So Amy, why don't you take it away? 
Great. Thank you, Zach. It's a great analogy, the roadblock, because I use the analogy a lot of times that we're not only trying to build a new road here, but sometimes we're building the car that goes on it. And yes, there are plenty of roadblocks to remove along the way. So during this quick 10 minutes, I'm going to give you just a high level review of MAPS Public Benefit Corp's MDMA for PTSD program and some insight into what's coming next. I think many of you are probably familiar with our research, but I know there could be a broad audience. So I'm not going to go deep into the background, but I'm going to give some background as well. I'm briefly going to cover MDMA assisted therapy, the structure of clinical trials that we've done, the status of our phase three program, and expected timelines for next steps, which include submitting an NDA or otherwise known as a new drug application to FDA. I think you're also probably aware of a bit about how MDMA works, so I'm gonna keep this high level, but to start, I just wanna kind of give some context. So MDMA serves as a catalyst to trauma-focused therapy. And while under the influence of MDMA, and then with the support of therapists, people are able to experience and express their fear, anger, and grief related to trauma. While this processing of emotion is happening, MDMA is facilitating a reduction of the conditioned fear response. And this can lead the person to feel more open and comfortable communicating about their past traumatic events, and it allows them to do so without feeling overwhelmed by the memory and emotion, which can happen with just straight talk therapy. And through this process, many people experience an internal awareness that even the most painful emotions are an important part of their therapeutic process and their healing. So with that, what does it then look like to actually go through the treatment? The first steps are going through eligibility and a screening process to make sure they meet the criteria. Then you enter a preparatory phase. This includes three 90-minute sessions with the therapy pair that you're going to be working throughout the study with. And following that, the person enters into the treatment period. So in that, there's three eight-hour MDMA assisted therapy sessions, and they're spaced about a month apart. And then each of those sessions is followed by some phone check-ins, as well as three integration visits. These are an incredibly important part of the process. We hear a lot about the drug-assisted therapy, but the integration is where so much of the work is done to help bring this into somebody's lives. And th there can be more integrations added if more support is needed. So, but the planned part, in total is three drug assisted sessions and 12 non-drug therapy sessions. And then because what I'm talking about right now is a clinical trial, there's also additional visits to complete study measures. And then the final assessment of how someone did in the study is made two months after their last drug assisted therapy session. So that's the model that we followed in phase three. And the results of our first phase three, which was called MAP1, which was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial and severe PTSD were published in Nature Medicine. You can read them in detail there. I'm going to give you a really quick review of them. If you've followed us for long, you probably have heard this already a number of times. And you should note, just for when I give you the results, that the active group was MDMA plus therapy, and the control group was placebo plus therapy. So the safety can be summarized as follows. It's not super exciting. No serious adverse events happened in the MDMA group and the most common adverse events, meaning they happened two times more in the MDMA group than in the placebo group were muscle tightness, decreased appetite, nausea, sweating, and feeling cold. And then we know that MDMA can transiently increase vital signs. So we did collect vital signs. This, this is kind of similar to what happens in exercise. And so we collected this, but none of those rose to the level of an adverse event. We did see that. The efficacy results are as follows. When you look at the clinical response, and this was the primary endpoint of the study, the data showed 88% of the people receiving MDMA-assisted therapy responded versus 60% in the control group. And when looking at another endpoint, PTSD diagnosis, our data showed that 67% of the people in the group receiving MDMA-assisted therapy had a loss of their PTSD diagnosis versus 32% in the control group. So that's the result of MAP1, our pivotal study. We have not completed our confirmatory phase three study, MAP2. And it's really important to understand that a full phase three program is about proving efficacy and safety. And until the whole program is done and reviewed by the FDA, you cannot consider your results to be conclusive of safety and efficacy. And also, I just want to say many times what you see in a clinical trial is not what you also see in real world practice. So that is yet to come. And though we're really pleased with these results, we are really looking forward to and need our MAP2 results and we need full review by the FDA. So where are we at with MAP2? Well, it was designed very similar to our first phase three, a planned enrollment of 100 participants, and in May, we completed that planned enrollment. 
And at that time, we did what is called a blinded administrative interim analysis to confirm no changes to that plan sample size of 100 were needed to ensure we had sufficient statistical power to detect efficacy in that study. So with that, we announced the completion of enrollment. We did not need to add anybody. And now we're focused on finishing all the study visits for those remaining participants. And we anticipate those final visits will complete sometime towards the end of this year. And then of course, we'll publish the results of that study. It'll probably be next year when we do that. And that will be the completion of our phase three program, which is a major milestone for us and a really important piece of the puzzle that allows us to get to the next steps on the path to approval. And those we're targeting for 2023. That will be the submission of our full package to FDA. This is the new drug application. And we anticipate FDA will make a decision about that package in 2024. So if we receive FDA approval, then the DEA has 90 days to reschedule out of schedule one. They reschedule the drug product. And when they do that, this also changes the restrictions placed on manufacturing, storage, and transportation of our drug product. So that is a federal rescheduling. In addition to that, every state has their own scheduling system. Some automatically do it with that. That's called parity, and some do not. They require a legislative or administrative action to complete the rescheduling. And this is needed in about half of the states, and there's a lot of work that's necessary to do that. So we're already laying the groundwork for that process. But I know there's some other panelists that are going to talk more about rescheduling. So I'm not going to go more deeply into what it means to schedule and reschedule. What else? What does this mean for the next steps as part of that file? What's going to happen? And what does that mean from commercial and regulatory standpoint? As part of that application, we have to submit all of our data and many, many, many other documents in these five modules. And one of them is a draft label. If MDMA-assisted therapy is approved, that final product label will also be approved at the same time. I think this will be the first drug-assisted therapy to be in a label and approved by the FDA. And in this label, we are, if approved, I should say, <laughs> we're hoping. In this label, we are proposing a broad indication for PTSD from any cause. So though we've studied it in severe and moderate severe, we would be looking at a broader indication than that. And if approved, this could include a potential treatment for 12 million patients. So this has the potential to make a really huge impact in the quality of patients' lives. We think this program is also going to include something called a REMS. REMS stands for Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy. So this is a drug safety program that the FDA can require, they don't always, but can require for certain medications that they consider having a serious safety concern. So it's used to help ensure the benefits of the medication outweigh its risks when it's implemented. We think that a REMS for MDMA-assisted therapy would be designed to mitigate risks of abuse, misuse, and diversion. And we have not seen these in our clinical trials, but the risk of it happening in the real world is something that we take serious. And so we're very actively involved in working with the REMS and assume that it will be necessary. But given at that same time that we are for having this REMS, we also see the tremendous unmet need for PTSD treatment, and we really have a priority for ensuring patient access. So REMS can create a block for patient access at times if they create too high of a bar. So we're really going to be working closely to ensure that when this REMS is implemented, it doesn't also unduly restrict patient access. So there's a lot of things we're already building into our program and that we've studied that we think will help to mitigate risks. And some of those are that this is given on site. The delivery of treatment is always on site and in the context of therapy. So those are things that are already built into the program. The rest of what's in the REMS, we will see as we start negotiating. And in addition to that program, which can affect your delivery of treatment, we also have to work with the DEA, as I mentioned, and this is under the Controlled Substances Act. So we have to ensure that our plan for approval and distribution is accepted by them also. So rescheduling will be done as one of our first steps, and then we'll really be looking to ensure that across the REMS and FDA and the DEA, our supply chain distribution is set up properly and accepted by both. One of our first steps in this is to select and contract with a specialty pharmacy to dispense the product to patients. And we're exploring two dispensing methods. One is directly to the patient. This is referred to as brown bagging. It's usually through the mail system. And the patient would then transport an unopened 
single dose of medication to their healthcare setting. Another option, and it may be something we have both of these options, is that the medication is delivered directly to the healthcare setting, and that's referred to as white bagging. And in this case, the medication is there, the patient goes to the site, they receive their medication during their scheduled therapy session. And with this, I know that there's still a lot of questions on the details of how this is actually going to look. And honestly, we still have more questions than answers as to how this is gonna look. It'll become more clear as we submit and we start to negotiate. I know there's also a lot of questions on who can be provider. So the treatment we're developing is the combination of MDMA and therapy. A prescriber will be necessary. They'll have to hold a schedule. We don't know what schedule will be. It'll be something out of schedule one though. And by definition, the person who delivers the supportive therapy must be licensed to do so. They must be a licensed healthcare provider with therapy as part of their scope of practice. So it could be a prescribing physician, it could be a psychiatrist, it could be a therapist such as a social worker, marriage family therapist, or a psychologist. We also believe a care team is going to be necessary, and but that exact makeup and the qualifications of that team are still going to have to be negotiated during our NDA process. So I can't answer a lot of questions about that, but you can look at the way it was studied and what was required in the trials, and many times your implementation follows that. So our vision for the future really includes finding ways post-approval. Once we get through all those steps for post-approval, we also really want to maintain a high quality of care with strong outcomes. And we think this is going to involve that we continue to collect real world data post-approval and learn from that, and that we ensure that as we're moving forward with implementation, that there are systems of certification, ethics, and safety required to support this work. And I think another part of our future is going to include many negotiations with healthcare payers, as we wanna ensure that when this is approved, there's equitable access. So I think with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Zach and I'm sure people will have a lot of more detailed questions than what I've provided here. So I look forward to answering those in the Q&A. Thank you, Amy. That was incredibly informative and answered a lot of the questions that I had. And thank you. That was a great overview. I do want to get into our next panelist and ask Chris to speak to his work with the task of rescheduling psilocybin and the role he plays at ITPRI. So Chris, why don't you take it away? Great. Thanks, Zach. So as Zach said during the introduction, we were established to promote and secure a rescheduling of psilocybin under the 1971 Convention on Psychotropic Substances, which is one of three international drug control regimes. And it's the one of the three regimes where psilocybin, along with MDMA, LSD, mescaline, and other psychedelic drugs are scheduled. And what the international drug control regimes do is they essentially outline obligations for state parties, that's governments who have signed the treaties, and you have to commit to the 1971 Psychotropic Substances Treaty Convention if you're a UN member. They outline the obligations of governments in terms of how they control those drugs for purposes of scientific and medical use. And the 1971 treaty was negotiated in response to the growing popularity of amphetamines and LSD in the late 1960s, because these drugs could not be scheduled under the 1961 Convention on Narcotic Substances, given that it was meant for particular other compounds. At the time, the classic psychedelic drugs were all put in Schedule 1 of the 1971 Convention, based on an assumption that they had no therapeutic value and posed a serious risk to public health. And the 1971 convention is made up essentially of four schedules, schedule one being the most restrictive. Again, I reserved for drugs that are in especially serious risk to public health and little therapeutic value. And then moving away two, three, and four being lower levels of risk to public health in terms of abuse liability and an increasing amount of therapeutic benefit or potential. And so these drugs were put in Schedule 1 based on this assumption. No medical and scientific assessment was done at the time to determine if that assessment was in fact correct. And what this means is that, as with other drugs in Schedule 1, it greatly increases the cost and complexity and the time it takes to undertake research. Schedule 1 drugs are subject to a particular set of provisions under the convention in terms of the need for governments to prohibit all but very limited scientific and medical use. And then within that bucket of limited and scientific and medical use, they have to implement various measures around licensing, safe custody, 
auditing, so on and so forth. So if a researcher wants to do research with a schedule one drug, they have to get a license for every facility, a license for every research project. It's very expensive, time consuming, administratively burdensome. They have to keep the drugs separate from uh, other drugs in a hospital or research facility. So for example, in the UK, a hospital can carry heroin in its facilities but they need to get a special license in a separate storage facility to carry psilocybin or LSD or MDMA. And so this essentially gums up the system. David Knight and Jack Henningfield and many others have written about the barrier or roadblock in this case that the international scheduling and how that is reflected in domestic drug control regimes, how that is a, is a barrier to advancing research and then ultimately the development of therapies for patients. So what we're trying to do is get psilocybin out of schedule one. And there are essentially three steps to the process of doing that. First, you need to get a review initiated. And there are three steps to get a potential pathways to get a re review initiated. Any party to the treaty can ask for a review. We're targeting about 12 governments based on a number of criteria, looking at their financing and support for mental health programs. Is there domestic interests in terms of research or commercial interests in the psychedelic space? What have they done with medical cannabis and what's been their approach to drug policy reform and harm reduction? Because we think those are all good in indi indicators. The second path is that the WHO itself can initiate a review. And the third path is that members of the expert committee on drug dependence, which report to the WHO, can initiate something called a pre-review leading to a review. And so if you get a review started, then what happens is the WHO's expert committee on drug dependence, which is made up of independent Scientific and medical experts do a medical and scientific assessment looking at toxicology, pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, what's the nature of international illicit trade in the substance, what previous efforts have been to con control international trade. And based on that, they make a determination looking at the abuse liability risk and the therapeutic potential or benefit of the drug, and then can make a recommendation to move psilocybin in this case out of schedule one to one of the other three schedules, which are totally unlike schedule one in terms of the controls that are required at the state party level. Presuming you get a positive recommendation out of the WHO expert committee on drug dependence, and we believe that it would be difficult for them to recommend anything other than rescheduling based on the current evidence, both on therapeutic benefit and abuse liability, then the decision goes to the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs, which is a political body. The UN CND has to accept the medical and scientific assessment of the WHO's expert committee on drug dependence, but then they can take into account any other factor they essentially want in making a decision as to whether to accept the WHO's recommendation or to do something different. So the WHO could recommend, well, we think it should be in Schedule 3. CND could say, we agree it should be moved, but we think it should be in Schedule 2. So that's the toughest part of the process. It's the most political part of the process. And CND at times is as a record of doing unreasonable things. There is precedent for rescheduling recently in the case of cannabis, where in December of 2020, the UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs accepted two of five recommendations from the WHO's expert committee on drug dependence to reschedule cannabis under both the 1961 convention and the 1971 convention. Strangely, it sits in both. And it did that based on the ECDD's assessment that cannabis had therapeutic potential and was less risky than the drugs with which it is currently scheduled. And I think this is rather interesting and provides great hope in the case of the rescheduling of psilocybin and hopefully other psychedelic drugs in the future, in the sense that the research on medical cannabis is not as nearly far advanced as the research on psilocybin in other drugs like MDMA. It's really nascent in some regards. So from a medical benefit perspective, I think the case on psilocybin is much stronger than cannabis. And obviously, I think anybody who's on this call who follows the space knows these drugs have a very low abuse liability concern in terms of creating addiction and dependence. So based on all those factors, we're pretty confident we can move this forward. I would be remiss if I didn't mention our coalition partners. We've managed to put together, I think, what's a pretty impressive coalition of organizations that are supporting us in this effort, which include MAPS, the Beckley Foundation, Drug Science, the Open Foundation, 
the Osmond Foundation, the Heroic Hearts Project, both in the UK and the US, AC in Mexico, they're still in Canada, Mind Medicine Australia, and the Psychedelics and Healing Initiative at the Global Wellness Institute. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Chris. I got a ton of questions for you, but we'll hold them off till the end. Sure. Today, why don't we have you take the floor and tell us about your work in the EU and the roadblocks that you are navigating there? Thanks, Zach. And great to be here with such super panelists. And it's been also interesting to hear about the roadblock definition. I think you can flip this around and think that they are called roadblocks, but not road obstacles, for instance, and there is a safety component built into this concept. Um, so they can also, in a way, perhaps help us to mitigate risks that are associated with a too hasty scale up of access. And as such, perhaps they could help us to protect the long-term sustainability of psychedelic medicine. I will speak about AREA and we've heard a lot about MAPS and rightly so, and there is a good chance you haven't heard much about AREA and this new work in Europe. So I'd like to cover that and also speak a bit about the specificities of Europe and European healthcare systems, because in the psychedelic space, a lot of discussions are centered around the US and the US kind of solutions. So I want to show how we, in a way, do things in Europe and what are the Europe-specific challenges. I've been in the public health space and policy space for quite a while now, and especially in the last few years, I've been a bit struck because I have not seen anything related to psychedelics happening in the Brussels bubble. No meetings, no discussions, nothing on the policy agenda. So a couple of years ago, this prompted me into creating this new partnership, which is called PAREA. PAREA st stands for Psychedelic Access and Research European Alliance. It's also a very nice Greek word. Feel free to look it up. And so we, we are this unique and multidisciplinary partnership. We bring together 15 member organizations. It's a membership-based organization. Most importantly for me, I wanted to have people with lived experience at the forefront of this cooperation. And so we have three influential EU patient organizations that are our members. They cover mental health, neurology, and chronic pain. We have one of the oldest and most influential EU cancer lobbies. Then there are professional organizations like European Co College of Neuropsychopharmacology. And then very importantly, we also have psychedelic foundations, most notably Open Foundation, but also Osmond, Drug Science, Beckley. And on top of this, there is a number of industry partners being Awaken, Beckley SciTech, and MindMed. So this is how Parea looks like. It's very diverse. And I think that in the EU, when policymakers see who our members are, this is already giving us a, some sort of a legitimacy. And it's a pointer for them that this is something important because we brought together these different groups. And what we are really after as, as an alliance in the end is a responsible integration of psychedelic medicines into mainstream health services in Europe. As I mentioned, there hasn't been much happening in Brussels when it comes to the EU institutions addressing psychedelic advances. And this has been confirmed in our interactions, PAREA, with EU. We had a number of meetings with senior EU policymakers over the last half a year, and it's almost shocking how unaware they are of the recent developments, both in science and also in kind of regulatory space. We are quite okay in Europe when it comes to science, but when it comes to um, developments in policy and regulations, they are kind of nowhere at the moment. And also, perhaps it's a good moment uh, for me to briefly explain to you uh, the overall architecture of the European Union. There are three political institutions which hold uh, the executive and legislative power of the Union. We have uh, the Council of the European Union. This brings together representatives from the governments. There are 27 EU member states. Then there is the European Parliament with 700 members of the European Parliament, or as we call them, MEPs. And just today and tomorrow, I'm in Brussels meeting with several MEPs and tomorrow with DG Research, which is part of the European Commission. The European Commission is the third uh, institution. It's a, in a, an executive arm in a way, and it represents the European level interests. And so there you have, say, Directorate General for Health, for Research, for Trade, and so on. I think it's important to note that the EU is anything but insignificant. The EU is the number one global regulator. That's because the uh, EU is usually 
setting the strictest rules and many companies would adopt them for the sake of simplicity. And also is the biggest medicine market. It accounts for a quarter of pharmaceutical sales. In other words, you spend some 200 billion euros every year in innovative drugs. So I think it's some of the reasons why it's so important that we do something in Europe. And it's not just a European priority, but a global one. And this is why we want to drive this transformative and systemic change at the European level. And so from my perspective, the number one challenge still in Europe is overcoming a negative perception of psychedelics and turning a constant into a variable showing that you cannot equate all the drugs. They are not all equal and there is a tremendous potential. When we do this, I think we want to avoid oversimplifying science for the sake of an attractive narrative. I think we are kind of beyond this stage and we want to embrace nuance, complexity. We want to have an honest dialogue about what's coming, what are the possible dangers. And I also want to speak a little bit about how we govern reimbursement and accessibility, because we know that reimbursement means different things in different parts of the world. In Europe, healthcare is generally provided free, so we have free access to care. And as such, the majority of pharmaceuticals are paid for by public funds, not privately. The EU also has a centralized regulatory approval mechanism for new medicines. We have the European Medicines Agency and the single market. So you think that so far so good, but in reality, things are much more complicated than this because when it comes to the pricing, when it comes to reimbursement, when it comes to availability or access of pharmaceuticals, there are very big variations. There is a huge access inequity, inequity in terms of time to patient access, especially for new medicines. Just to give you a flavor, Romanians will wait on average 899 days after a drug is approved before this is available for patients. And this can be contrasted with Germany, where the, the patients wait 133 days. But it's not just about time to access, but also what novel treatments are available at all. And here, another example is that patients in Italy can access seven out of 10 medicines that are approved. Why? Again, in Romania, this will be less than two out of 10. So there is this big differences. And there are also big differences when it comes to price of the medicines. And ultimately, all this is because uh, distribution and accessibility decisions are really in the hands of member states. And in fact, Brussels has no competences really to legislate on health matters with some exceptions. So it's solely the member states' competences, and this is regulated by the EU treaties. And by the way, I also want to mention that a direct marketing of pharmaceuticals to consumers is definitely not allowed in Europe. So this is another difference. So. With this, the Commission is pretty eager to improve the access and make it more even. And so we see now that the European Commission is doing a major revision of the bloc's pharmaceutical strategy. This hasn't been touched for 20 years. And the idea is to have more coordination at the EU level, looking at all the stages of R&D, starting with clinical trials, marketing authorization, health technology assessment bodies. This is how we, in Europe, look beyond clinical evidence and look at the kind of the economic side of things. And I also want to mention that, again, speaking about this global dimension of the European Union, the, we know that the impacts of this EU pharmaceutical legislation will be felt for decades. And the EU legislation is likely to spill over effect into other parts of the world via free trade agreements. We believe that it's a perfect opportunity also for us to spotlight the psychedelic sector. So we are really engaging a lot now with the European Commission. We hope that they will include in this revision specificities relevant to psychedelic medicines, such as having this kind of complicated equation, a package of drug and therapy. This is no longer just a kind of a medicine, it's more like a clinical care pathway. So I will stop here. I'm happy to take any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Tadeus. That's a thoughtful and extensive overview of what's happening in Europe. To your point, most of the action, so to speak, is focused on North America. So it's good to get an understanding of what the European landscape is looking like. And last but not least, I want to turn the floor over to Graham Pachenik, who's going to speak about patents and intellectual property. So Graham, take it away. Thank you, Zach. And thank you to my other co-panelists for your thoughts and Today, hearing what you said about inequality of access, especially for new medicines and inequalities in terms of the types of novel treatments available and 
differences in prices, that really summarizes the issues that patents raise as roadblocks too. I think we can address those or think about those through the ones of the patent system as well. But maybe before getting to those, we can even talk about why we have patents at all. Patents are generally seen as a bargain that the government makes on behalf of the public. So to the extent it's a government roadblock, the public is taking a part in this bargain by allowing the government to grant this temporary monopoly when an inventor comes up with something that's new and not obvious. And this is something that many people will say it's enshrined in the U S constitution that says the patent system is for promoting the progress of science and the useful arts. And when we think about it, incentivizing innovation, we think about the problems that pharma faces in terms of bringing new drugs to market, the cost, the time, the risk of clinical development. How do those things happen? How do those things get funded? Obviously we have a very good counterpoint to the patent system or the requirement or need of the reward of the patent system here with Amy and with MAPS, because of course MAPS is not only not using the patent system, but taking an anti-patent strategy, they've called it and relying on data exclusivity as an incentive. But there are a number of other alternative incentive structures that it proposes alternatives to the patent system, sort of under the umbrella of what's often called delinkage. Interestingly, Pfizer actually just announced a half a million dollar investment in a decentralized science DAO for longevity research called Vita DAO, showing even big pharma is aware that there are these alternative incentive structures and how they might affect their business model. But there's things like paper success contracts and prize funds and crowdfunding. But I won't really talk about those today, but really just patents, but kind of just flagging the fact that those exist and there are ways of potentially moving outside the patent system. If you look at just pharmaceuticals generally before it gets to psychedelics and the patent system, I think it's pretty well recognized, or it can be that the bargain with the public, that this bargain that's enshrined in the constitution has really broken down. And we see from both sides of it, the monopolies have gotten longer, they've gotten stronger. Companies are filing hundreds of patent applications on what's the same drug. And the other side, there's just less and less innovation. And these are kind of work together. Myself, personally, I'm a type one diabetic. I use insulin. Insulin something that was invented in the 1920s. Very famously, the inventors of insulin sold their rights to the patent on insulin for a dollar to the University of Toronto. And yet I'm still paying hundreds of dollars a month as many people are, and many people even are going without insulin for something because of the fact that people are filing these incremental patents on things like the injection device that's used to administer it. And we see this across the pharmaceutical space and what's often by pharmaceutical companies called life cycle management, maybe more pejoratively by others called evergreening or product hopping. But the result is these problems that today was mentioned, cost increases during patent life because of the ability to set monopoly pricing, less access to drugs, patients going without life-saving medicines. And of course, patents aren't the only problem with drug pricing. There's a lot of things with insurance and pharmaceutical benefit managers, and a big ecosystem of people who have their hands in lobbying for these profits to say hi, but when patents are terminated at the end of a patent life, the cost of drugs generally goes down three quarters, 90%, often close to zero because of the ability of generics to come onto the market. And pharma profits are among the highest of any industry. So of course, there's this imbalance, I think we can generally accept between the reward that the patent system gives and the ability to bring new drugs to market. So are pharmaceutical patents really promoting progress or are they promoting profits and are they promoting patient health or are they kind of working towards profit maximization rather than progress and, and innovation? There's a lot of truth to what Shayla Law, if people have read about psychedelic patents in particular, her articles and vice, I think her most recent was entitled psychedelic patents are broken because the patent system is broken. So before we even get to pharmaceutical patents, we can see we're already within this system that's in dire need of reform. So psychedelic patents themselves might have problems, but we're in this broader pharmaceutical patent system that itself has these structural failings that cause these problems with being able to get drugs and being able to have new drugs and being able to have drugs at reasonable prices. But there are actually differences as well in, within psychedelics and the psychedelic space that makes this bad system even worse. For instance, patents generally are seen as a negotiation with a patent examiner. Often patent examiners are able to grant 
applications that don't really contain much novelty because they're rushed in how the patent examination process takes place. And so we get these overbroad and often low quality, sometimes called patents. But with psychedelics in particular, there's this lack of the kind of traditional prior art. In the pharmaceutical space, these low quality patents are granted even though there is a huge history of incremental patents being filed for years and years and articles published in the sorts of traditional places where a patent examiner will search. Even though they don't spend much time, they'll search in particular places where they'll find that sort of pharmaceutical prior art. But with psychedelics, we see kind of an absence of this type of prior art that's available to a patent examiner. One thing that's also very unique about the psychedelic space is, unlike pharma, which has a sort of fairly regimented way of the branded kind of innovative company pursues and gets patents on new chemical entities. And you know maybe they stretch their patent monopoly by getting all these formulation patents and drug delivery and dosing and other patents later on. But in the psychedelic space, because we had this large number of classic psychedelics and other psychedelics that are already in the prior art, there's now many companies, often in some cases, like with psilocybin, dozens of companies all filing for patent rights on the same compounds. So unlike the pharmaceutical space where the goal perhaps for reform is to push a single pharmaceutical company into having maybe a more reasonable balance between the innovation they've contributed and the profit they seek. We now also have a number of companies who may have the ability to sue each other for the work that they're doing. And we have statements on record from some of the biggest companies in psychedelics for saying they're going to defend the work they're doing against others. And if you look outside of the pharmaceutical industry for other problems with the patent system, we've seen that emergent industries generally, all the way back from the steam engine with airplane and the radio up through smartphones, they were mired in this wasteful litigation. I spent a long time in my career before starting a firm working on these smartphone patent cases between Google and Apple. And at the height of it, they were spending far more on patent litigation. Of course, this was great for patent attorneys, but far more on patent litigation than actual innovation. And this is something that we've seen through all these other emerging industries. Once companies obtain strong patent rights, they stop innovating and they turn their attention to making sure that they don't have competitors. This happened, for instance, very famously with the Wright brothers. They got the first patents on the flying machine, even though there was this vibrant ecosystem of other people trying to make airplanes at the same time who aren't really remembered now, the Wright brothers spent all their efforts suing them until the airplane industry developed outside of the range of their patent rights in Europe. And by the time World War I started, the U.S. almost didn't even have any planes. There were Congress that actually had this congressman who stepped in and introduced bills to prevent the Wright brothers from suing anybody. I mean, there's some funny comments on the record from congressmen saying that if it was for the Wright brothers and their patents, we'd be flying in World War I with blimps because we couldn't have planes. There's a problem too that we might see in this space where by the number of competitive patents held by a number of competitors would focus folks' attention not on continuing innovation, but actually pursuing litigation. And so obviously directing that money away from innovation is another violation of this bargain between the public for the right of granting patents. And this is also not even to mention the other problems that aren't so much inherent to the patent system, which is more broadly potentially problematic. So this is not to get into issues with the fact that many of what we see in the psychedelic space relies on traditional indigenous knowledge that doesn't even really fit into what we call prior art, which generally goes kind of without recognition or reward. And this also goes not to mention what just four years ago or so came from Bob Jesse's statement on open science and open praxis, where he talked about the, the field of psychedelics being marked by cooperation instead of competition and the open sharing of knowledge. And had many people sign on to place their discoveries into the public domain for the benefit of all, not even before getting within the failings of the patent system. The patent system itself represents this Western capitalist perspective founded on these ideals of the lone genius inventor and this winner-take-all drive to profit that maybe stands apart a bit from ethos, ethos we would like to see within the psychedelic space. There's people, for instance, like Mason Marks at Harvard's Poplar, who had written an article, perhaps we shouldn't have patents on psychedelics at all. We can query whether that's manageable to do, but it goes to show that the range of what might be possibilities for thinking what we might see as policy for psychedelic patents is actually pretty broad. But so what can we do about these problems? One of them, of course, since the pharmaceutical patent system has these failings, is just to try to address those. Of course, the pharmaceutical industry and pharmaceutical industry lobbyists are amongst the strongest there are. So trying to sit across from 
pharmaceutical lobbyists and hammer away at changes in the patent system is a difficult one, but patent reform, especially around pharmaceuticals, is a very active area. The New York Times has published a recent editorial on it. There's a, a bill from Senator Tillerson Leahy that was just introduced at the beginning of August that's trying to address some of the problems, especially around low quality patents that probably would have a pretty strong value for the psychedelic space too, because the problem they're trying to address is the fact that patent examiners have very little time to find prior art and very little time to actually examine patents. This would give them the ability to find more prior art and make better judgments around what inventions actually are innovative and deserving of a patent monopoly. Also just increasing the standards for patentability. This life cycle management, this evergreening, it happens because the standard for what is non-obvious and what's inventive is actually quite low. So the ability to you know, take insulin and put it from a certain type of injector into another type of injector, is that really something that has clinical advantages? So there are other patent systems around the world. India is very well known for having an efficacy standard where a new pharmaceutical formulation, and they, for instance, prevent enantiomers and polymorphs. So things like esketamine or psilocybin polymorph wouldn't be something that's even patentable in a country like India or others that share that standard. We're doing things like more of a balancing test. So when we grant this monopoly right, is it fair to give everybody 20 years or even more than 20 years, or should that exclusivity period be more commensurate with the actual R&D expenditure or the public benefit or clinical benefit of something? And of course, the patent system too, even though people talk about it a lot in the psychedelic space, it's something that's very closed off to the public. Patent examination is done entirely ex parte. There's the possibility to introduce prior art into patent examinations, but there's very few opportunities for public participation. It's very expensive. We heard from some reporting that it's cost over a million dollars to challenge certain patents in the psychedelic space. Even just a minimal challenge can be hundreds of thousands of dollars in fees or more. So more opportunities for that, more opportunities for involvement in the patent system itself. The patent system has a patent public advisory committee, but the people on it are generally representatives of industry, Eli Lilly, other pharmaceutical companies, Facebook have representatives, but there aren't really representatives of people like patient organizations or advocacy organizations that may have an interest in having the patent standards be raised so that the cost of drugs is lower. And then failings, particularly the psychedelics patents, of course, some people may know of Porta Sophia, which is trying to gather psychedelic prior art and use that to address low quality patents. Also holding psychedelics companies accountable, encouraging companies to be innovative, not just around patents and profit, but around ethics too. Celebrating companies who are pursuing non-extractive business models like public benefit corporations and nonprofits, adopting norms around reciprocity, benefit sharing, and ethical principles like the North Star Pledge. And there's many ways for psychedelic companies to work individually and together, not just to use patents as means of exclusion, but also means of collaboration and cooperation. And also, I think the big thing too, that often doesn't get said in the conversation around patents is patents is really focused on the medical system. Encouraging decriminalization and legalization to happen more quickly ensures access outside of the medical system and often outside of the system that's controlled by patents. And so the ability for people to have broader access to psychedelics outside of the medical system will have ways of reducing some of the barriers and roadblocks that the patent system puts up. One statement that I often come back to myself when thinking about patents is Greg Doblin's when he says about psychedelics, that psychedelics are tools which are not good and bad in and of themselves, but how they're used and in the relationship you have with them. And so I often think the same about patents too, and that patents are really tools and that the way companies use them and interact with them can be good or bad. They can be used anti-competitively. They needn't be. And one of the things that makes me feel that there's optimism in this space is the number of companies who are approaching patents in a way to protect their innovation, but not overreach, not find ways to be anti-competitive or to claim things that aren't theirs or were in the prior art. And so I think there is room for optimism here. And so I'll pause there, but I appreciate being able to talk about patents as roadblocks and hope they can be removed. Thanks, Graham. As always, super informative and very helpful. Thank you, everybody, for submitting questions. I'm going to read a few of them and see which one of our panelists want to take a crack at answering them. The top question, which comes from Bridget, I'm a senior undergraduate student in the U.S., very interested in psychedelic medicine. What are some of the paths and or resources I should consider to become a psychedelic therapist in the U.S.? Perhaps, Amy, this might be something in your wheelhouse. What are the pathways for becoming a psychedelic therapist right now. And what are the roadblocks to that? <laughs> As I said, 
at least the main person on the therapy team and the care team will need to be licensed and experienced with trauma. So I think that's a pretty straightforward way to get into the, into the area. Now, once there's an approval, if there is an approval and care teams start to form, it's possible that there'll be other roles on that team where people can be an intern and not be licensed as a therapist, but be an intern or be a support person in some way. But I think the most direct route is to get licensed and practice in trauma therapy. Great. Thank you. Today, as perhaps you can take a stab at the next question, how can someone from a small European country, Latvia particularly, get involved in this process to incorporate these drugs in the healthcare system? While small countries might be extremely slow to adjust to new changes, would these treatments be available for foreigners who would not be able to get treatment in their own country? That's an interesting sort of idea of medical tourism, which perhaps we'll see more and more in the psychedelic space. That's already a, a prominent feature with retreats and certain countries that have legal access. I like this question because it touches upon a lot of things that are actual happening at the moment. Maybe I'll start at the end. The EU thought about the medical tourism and we do not necessarily call it a medical th tourism, but this can be one as well. But we have something that is called a cross-border healthcare directive which says that EU citizens have the right to access healthcare in any EU country and to be reimbursed for care abroad by their home country. Again, it sounds good, but it's much more complicated in reality. But yes, there is such a mechanism and we can expect that people would also want to seek psychedelic assisted treatments outside of their country if they cannot do it in their country. So I mentioned the pharma strategy revision. One of the ideas is that Improving access can also happen by mobilizing the sponsors, mobilizing the companies to file for marketing authorities. So once the European Medicines Agency approves a drug, it can be available in every country, but it is not, as I said. There are many reasons, but there are also reasons that are commercial or for different reasons, companies might choose not to apply for a marketing authorization in a, in a given particular country. The pharma strategy, it looks like it will oblige the companies to apply and it will give the companies a deadline, which will be two years from the central approval by EMA. So this is already one way of improving access because we know that wealthy countries, as well as bigger countries, have more leverage when negotiating with pharma companies. And so they get better conditions and they get more access. Thank you, Tad. I have a question for Chris. I'm curious if you could shed some light on, if not the progress or the strategy or the timeline that you envision for the advocacy work that you're doing. It's common for us to speculate and look out onto the horizon with drug development, for example, or policy reform at the state level in the U.S. about understanding the timeline for these key milestone developments. But I'm wondering if you even if it's a gut sense about the process of change that you're working on, do you have a sense of milestones that you're looking ahead to and when they might come to pass? We're very much focused right now while we are pursuing all three pathways that I outlined to get in a review initiated. And then obviously we'll focus on the second and third stage if we are successful in doing so. Most of our efforts are going into mobilizing a state party to request for review in the sense that once it's requested, that has to happen. I think we can get a state party and I'm more confident in some of our targets than others to ask for a review within the next 12 to 18 months. I think that's probably the easiest part of the process. Mm -hmm. And then the ECDD in terms of how long they take to undertake a medical and scientific assessment is really up to them and their process. In some cases in cannabis, they slow walked it for political reasons and it took a long time. I think given the public attention around psychedelics and the great promise of psilocybin shows and the increase in psychiatric disorders as a result of COVID, that they're likely to look at this fairly quickly. And then again, the final stage of the process, the UNCND, in the case of cannabis, delayed a vote on a number of occasions, given opposition from the Russian and the Chinese bloc to rescheduling, again, for political reasons. But I think the same factors that would weigh on the WHO would probably lead to a fairly quick consideration of the issue. And I just don't expect the same kind of opposition to psilocybin rescheduling that there was to cannabis rescheduling. So I think 
we can probably get the thing done in the next two or three years. And I think it's important. I, a lot of people assume that once MDMA gets approved by the FDA in the U.S., that MDMA is rescheduled, which isn't the case. MAPS MDMA will be rescheduled. So other researchers looking at MDMA will still have to go through the same hoops. Same with psilocybin. If Compass gets through first, it'll be Compass 360 and only the psilocybin. And so while there'll be progress in bringing drugs to market, there's obviously a lot of research to still be done on a lot of indications. This is going to be going on for years, given how long it takes to get through the FDA approval process. And so even getting a rescheduling of psilocybin in a three-year time frame would, would mean a lot in terms of advancing the ball and getting those treatments developed into approved therapies for patients. Thanks, Chris. Maybe Amy or Graham can take this one on. It's a question about the rescheduling of MDMA upon FDA approval. Would that be MDMA writ large, or would that be simply MAPS? And I think this is around a concept of bifurcated scheduling that perhaps he, one of you can speak to. I'd love to hear what other panelists say. I think Chris kind of answered this in his last answer there. It's very possible they'll do a bifurcated scheduling. That's not our preference. And then in a lot of ways, we're different than just a straight drug development company, because that's my side of the house, MAPS PVC. But MAPS does a lot of public policy work and changing of policy. And I know that they will be working hard to, if a bifurcated scheduling does happen, they'll be working through other avenues to try and get MDMA rescheduled. We just don't know until we go to negotiate exactly what's going to happen. I'm curious to hear what the other panelists think. It seems like probably, I'm guessing, regulatory agencies are going to want a bifurcation. I would defer to you, Amy, as you're closer to the conversations going on, but certainly the precedent, as far as I'm aware, has always been toward Fibrosicated scheduling with you know, Marinol and THC and the Epidiolex and CP, at least in the U.S. with the FDA. That's my expectation. I think most people who may not be as close to folks at MAPS, but, but, but most others, I think, would presume that it would be bifurcated scheduling. That's my assumption as well. But again, Amy, you're closer to the situation than others, but that seems to be the precedent with, with the DEA in the U.S. And I expect it would be the same here, but... Maybe not. There's a question here. I'm going to toss it up to Graham. How is it possible to obtain a patent on psilocybin when it is a compound that grows organically everywhere? That's a really good question. I think that's a question that's often answered by the fact that how pharmaceutical companies can get 200 or more patents on a compound after the compound itself is already patented. So those same strategies can be applied to a compound that's not patentable like psilocybin. The patents that most people are probably familiar with with psilocybin are probably compasses, which are on this crystalline solid form, which is a particular crystalline structure. So it's not psilocybin, the compound, but it's a three-dimensional crystalline structure with an excipient of psilocybin in a particular purified form. So there's that style of filing patents, but there's also the different types of formulations and drug dosing and method of use patents, so methods of treating different conditions. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of patents filed on psilocybin. None of them cover the just compound itself or the compound as it would be in nature. And there's a judicial exception just generally on patenting products of nature. But once there are some sort of intervention by humans and combining them with other things that, in a way that takes them out of how they are in their natural state, then they can be patented. Great. Thanks, Graham. I think this will be our last question from the audience. In what ways would rescheduling psychedelics facilitate the process of doing research? Is that a cost? Is that in time? Is that in availability? What are the ways in which research would be facilitated if certain compounds were reclassified? I'll touch on the international piece. The rescheduling internationally essentially allows governments to institute changes to the domestic regulatory regimes in terms of how they control medical and scientific use with these substances. By moving psilocybin out of Schedule 1, the requirements that governments are obligated to put in place change. And so governments that are minded to make changes to the domestic regulatory control regimes, and I believe there are governments like Canada that are minded to do so, they then have a legal, uh, a permissive environment for both a legal and an evidentiary basis to do so. And then that addresses cost, complexity, duration. It simply simplifies the process in terms of the hoops that the researchers have to jump through, the investment they have to make, the administrative burden, and the, and the time it takes. So it would be a much 
quicker, more efficient, and less costly process for research to be undertaken in terms of various projects that are often delayed by significant amounts of time due to scheduling requirements. That will conclude our panel discussion today on the roadblocks to implementing psychedelic-assisted therapies. I want to thank our panelists for joining us today. I want to thank the audience for your questions and involvement. And I will turn it over to Floris to, to lead us out. Well, Zach, thank you so much for moderating today. Thank you today is Amy, Graham and Chris for being here, for introducing us to the roadblocks and of course, how we can overcome them. It's been awesome hosting you here. And for everyone joining today, thank you for being here. Thank you for the engaging questions. I hope to see you at ICPR, be it in person, be it live at the business event or the rest of ICPR. And otherwise, I think we'll meet at another event in the future. So thank you all so much for being here today. And I wish you all a good night or afternoon if you're in the US. And uh, bye bye. Thanks, Lars. <laughs>